On May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., the citizens of Washington State in Oregon were the first people to encounter one of the most destructive volcanic eruptions in United States history. The eruption of Mount St. Helens, in which 57 people lost their lives. The aftermath of this eruption was so devastating, it forced volcanologists to explore new ways of predicting volcanic eruptions, changing the way volcanoes are monitored forever. The volcano Mount St. Helens is one of the most destructive volcanoes in U.S. history. It was first encountered by the Cowlitz and the Klickitat Native Americans some 7,000 years ago. These native tribes respected the mountain because they had witnessed its fiery power many times. The first recorded sighting of the volcano was made by the British explorer George Vancouver when he sailed his ship up along the west coast of America in 1792. He named the mountain after his mentor, Lord Fitzherbert, the Baron of St. Helens. One of the next recorded encounters of the volcano was in 1805 by the famous explorers Lewis and Clark. William Clark wrote in his journal that Mount St. Helens was the most noble-looking object of its kind in nature. Both of these explorers did not witness an eruption from the volcano, but stories from the Native Americans have evidence that the mountain probably erupted several times during the 1800s. On the 20th of March, 1980, an earthquake measuring magnitude 4 on the Richter scale ruptured deep within Mount St. Helens, drawing the attention of geologists and volcanologists from Hawaii and the United States Geological Survey. Many more earthquakes occurred over the next few days. On March 27th, small steam explosions formed a crater measuring 200 feet deep and 1,500 feet across. The USGS needed an observation post near the volcano. They towed this old camp trailer up a logging road to a rock quarry and set it up. It was just five and a half miles from the north flank of Mount St. Helens, and at least one scientist was there at all times to make visual observations and to take pictures. This outpost was called Coldwater 2, and their mission was to explore the possibilities of a major eruption from Mount St. Helens. Among the geologists was David A. Johnston, a new recruit at the U.S. Geological Survey. In April, magma started building up inside of the mountain, forming a bulge on the north face of the mountain. Soon, the bulge started growing at the steady rate of 5 feet per day. It was soon sticking out of the volcano by 400 feet. Geologists knew that if even a small earthquake or rockfall occurred, it could trigger a massive landslide on the north face, leading to an eruption. The government evacuated the locals and set up a 20-mile red zone around the volcano, in which no one was allowed. Resort owner Harry Randall Truman, who lived five miles away from the north face of the mountain, refused to leave his home. He stated that he'd lived there for 50 years of his life and wasn't going to leave, believing that an eruption wouldn't destroy his home. On the quiet morning of May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m., the United States Geological Survey got a radio message from Coldwater 2. The message was from David A. Johnston, who was stationed there for the day. There was a ham operator who recorded two radio transmissions from David Johnston after 8.32 a.m. that morning, and the first was, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it, and then there was silence probably less than a minute, and then the radio repeater clicks on, says, Vancouver, is the transmitter on? And then it clicked off, and there was no further contact with David Johnston. The whole north face of the mountain fell in the largest landslide in recorded history. Triggered by an earthquake measuring 5.1 on the Richter scale, the avalanche tore open the side of the mountain where the bulge used to be, unleashing a volcanic blast of ash, magma, rock, and gas that had been pressurized inside of the volcano like a pressure cooker bomb. The 1000 degree Fahrenheit blast rocketed out of the mountain at 300 miles per hour, destroying and scorching 150 square miles of forest and land almost instantly including Harry R. Truman's home. The snow on the mountain melted, causing massive mud flows called lahars. 
these mud flows poured down the sides of the mountain, burning and submerging everything they flowed through. After the initial blast, the citizens of Oregon and Washington State encountered the plume of ash that could be seen for hundreds of miles, soaring 12 miles into the sky. Todd Went, who was 12 years old at the time, climbed up an observatory water tower in Seattle to see that the horizon to the south of him was dominated by a black cloud of ash. Soon, ash began to fall like snow, and at noon, street lamps 85 miles away turned on in Yakima, Washington, because it was pitch black, as if it were midnight. In just four days, the ash had made its way to the Atlantic Ocean, and in two weeks, it had circled the globe. Half an inch of ash covered the ground in places as far away as Oklahoma. Two to five inches of ash covered the valley beneath the mountain, and several airports were closed with over 1,000 flights being canceled due to poor visibility. Many people were unable to use their cars because if they did, ash would clog up their engines. The mud flows from the mountain made their way to the Tootle River, which swelled from 200 feet wide to a third of a mile wide. The log, ash, and debris-filled river violently destroyed 27 bridges, several houses, and many miles of railroad track. In total, 57 lives were lost, including the lives of David A. Johnston and Harry R. Truman. 221 homes and 185 miles of road were destroyed. $320 million worth of private property was gone, and 230 square miles of forest around the volcano was scorched and flattened, along with the countless animals that were killed. The land around the volcano was now a wasteland that resembled the moon. Mount St. Helens was now 1,300 feet shorter after losing one cubic mile of earth in the eruption, and the crater two miles wide was in the place of the once snow-capped peak it was known for. So following the May 18, 1980 eruption, in the summer of 1980, it was apparent that Mount St. Helens was going to continue to erupt. There were steam and ash eruptions and dome building inside the crater. But none of these eruptions were as disastrous or as deadly as the May 18th eruption. So for the next six years, scientists and researchers learned a lot from Mount St. Helens. The U.S. Geological Survey collected and explored the data from these eruptions. Monitoring methods were developed. They were tested and they were perfected. A well-coordinated group of scientists at the New Cascades Volcano Observatory were figuring out how to monitor volcanoes. The collected data was soon used when they helped monitor another volcano. In 1985, there was an eruption of Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia, South America. So scientists went to Colombia to help with volcano monitoring. And because they had been working on Mount St. Helens, perfecting the monitoring methods, they were very familiar with what was going on down there. They were familiar with the type of volcano that erupted, because Nevada Nevado del Ruiz is very similar to Mount St. Helens. So what scientists learned at Mount St. Helens about the types of signals that indicate a volcano may be about ready to erupt, they could apply at Nevado del Ruiz, and then they realized they could apply this at volcanoes around the world. The 1980 eruptions of Mount St. Helens changed geologists and volcanologists' views on volcanic eruptions. It improved their knowledge of volcanoes and helped them explore new methods of monitoring and predicting volcanic eruptions. The Volcano Disaster Assistance Program was formed by the U.S. Geological Survey because of the eruptions from Mount St. Helens. Their mission is to exchange their new methods of monitoring and predicting volcanic eruptions with other geologists and volcanologists. And today, they still use the information from the 1980 eruptions of Mount St. Helens to monitor and predict other volcanic eruptions with a whole new perspective. 